Hello class, I hope you are doing well. My name is Dr. Villaroya and I will be giving a lecture about the lung. The main function of the lung is for air conduction and gas exchange. Developmentally, is an outgrowth from the ventral wall of the foregut. For the left lung, you have two lobes. For the right lung, you have three lobes. The midline trachea develops from two lateral outpocketings called the lung buds. The lung buds eventually divide into branches called the lobar bronchi. You have three on the right and two on the left, thus giving rise to three lobes on the right and two lobes on the left. So this is a schematic diagram of the airway. The most proximal portion is called the trachea and the most distal is called the alveoli. In the trachea, you have presence of your cartilage, it's your hyaline cartilage and the lining epithelium is of your pseudo-satified columnar ciliated. The trachea eventually divides to your bronchus and similar with the trachea, the bronchus also contains hyaline cartilage. Eventually, it further divides to your bronchioles and, and it leads to the most distal portion called the alveolar walls. The lining epithelium of the alveoli is lined by a simple squamous epithelium which permits the diffusion of your oxygen and carbon dioxide to the blood vessels. Further branching of the bronchioles leads to the terminal bronchioles, which are less than 2 mm in diameter. The part of the lung distal to the terminal bronchiole is called the asinus. It is roughly spherical with a diameter of around 7 mm. An asinus is composed of your respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar sacs. So remember that class. The ability of the lung to exchange gas is due to the microscopic anatomy of the alveolar walls and it consists of an intertwining network of capillaries with endothelial cells in the interstitium. It's lined by a simple squamous epithelium which permits the, the diffusion of gas. So you can see here class that the lining epithelium is also called your type 1 pneumocyte. So this covers 95% of the alveolar surface. The type 2 pneumocyte is actually a macrophage and is responsible for synthesizing surfactant and, it's, and is also involved in the repair of alveolar epithelium through its ability to give rise to type 1 cells. Now, let's discuss the congenital anomalies of the lung. Pulmonary hypoplasia is the defective development of both lungs caused by abnormalities that compress the lung or impede normal expansion in utero, such as in the case of your congenital diaphragmatic hernia and oligohydramnios. Severe hypoplasia is fatal in the early neonatal period. So as you can see here, class, this is actually the thoracic cavity. It's bisected. You can see here, this is your heart. And this is the hypoplastic lung. This is the liver. This is the intestine. You can see that the, the lungs are very hypoplastic. It's similar in appearance to your lung buds empty thoracic cavity as you can see here on this picture this is your trachea with the larynx the right lung is well developed but the left lung is hypoplastic so this is your pulmonary hypoplasia foregut cysts arise from abnormal detachments of the primitive foregut and are most often located in the hilum or middle mediastinum Depending on the wall structure, these cysts are classified as bronchogenic, esophageal, or enteric. So if it's lined by a respiratory epithelium, you call that your bronchogenic cyst. If it's lined by a, a squamous epithelium, you call that your esophageal cyst. If it's lined by a gastric epithelium, you call that your enteric cyst. Pulmonary sequestration refers to a discrete area of lung tissue that lacks any connection to the airway system and has an abnormal blood supply arising from the aorta or its branches. So it can be interlobar or extralobar. Atelectasis refers to incomplete expansion of the lung or the collapse of a previously inflated lung, producing areas of relatively airless pulmonary parenchyma. 
The main types of acquired atelectasis, which is encountered principally in adults, are the following. So an example of your acquired atelectasis is your resorption atelectasis. This stems from complete obstruction of an airway. Over time, air is resorbed from the dependent alveoli which collapse. Since lung volume is diminished, the bagestinum shifts toward the atelectatic lung. Compression atelectasis results whenever significant volumes of fluid, it can be either your transudate or extrudate or blood, tumor or air accumulate within the pleural cavity. With compression atelectasis, the bagestinum shifts away from the affected lung. So again, class in resorption atelectasis, the magistinum shifts towards the atelectatic lung. In contrast, your compression atelectasis, the magistinum shifts away from the affected lung. Contraction atelectasis occurs when focal or generalized pulmonary or pleural fibrosis prevents full lung expansion. So now we will be discussing about pulmonary edema. So when you say edema, it's the accumulation of fluid within tissues. Pulmonary edema can have many causes. An example would be your increased hydrostatic pressure, which is common in left-sided heart failure, or it can be due to your decreased oncotic pressure, such as in nephrotic syndrome. Pulmonary edema can also be due to infections, inhalation injury, and even due to your high altitude. Hemodynamic pulmonary edema can be due to increased hydrostatic pressure, the most common of which is due to your left-sided congestive heart failure. The fluid eventually accumulates in the basal regions of the lower lobes, which can be seen on chest x-ray. Microscopically, acute pulmonary congestion exhibits engorged alveolar capillaries, alveolar septal edema, focal intraalveolar hemorrhage, and the presence of your intraalveolar transudate that appears as a finely granular pink material, as you can see here. In chronic pulmonary congestion, which is often caused by congestive heart failure, the septa are thickened and fibrotic, and the alveoli often contain numerous hemosiderin linden macrophages, also called your heart failure cells. Acute lung injury, also called your non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, is characterized by the abrupt onset of significant hypoxemia and bilateral pulmonary infiltrates in the absence of cardiac failure. Acute respiratory distress syndrome is a manifestation of severe acute lung injury. Both are associated with inflammation-associated increases in pulmonary vascular permeability, edema, and epithelial cell death. The histologic manifestation of these diseases is called your diffuse alveolar damage. This table class shows numerous conditions associated with the development of your acute respiratory distress syndrome. So it can be due to infections, physical injury, chemical injury, or even systemic diseases. So here class, you can see an image which compares the normal alveolus and the one that has your acute lung injury. Acute lung injury or ARDS is initiated by injury of pneumocytes and the pulmonary endothelium. Endothelial activation is a very important early event class. The immune cells secrete mediators such as your tumor necrosis factors that act directly or indirectly on the endothelium as you can see here. These activated endothelial cells express increased levels of your adhesion molecules, procoagulant proteins, and chemokines that will further attract neutrophils. So this leads to the migration of your neutrophils from the circulation towards inside the alveolar spaces, where they release inflammatory mediators, including proteases, reactive oxygen species, and cytokines. They will cause tissue damage and eventually there will be formation of your hyaline membranes 
and accumulation of your edema fluid. If the stimulus is removed last, there will be resolution of injury. The hallmark of your ARDS is the presence of your hyaline membranes and this is due to the accumulation of necrotic debris and necrotic cells. Grossly, the lungs appear heavy, firm, red, and boggy. Microscopically, there is congestion, interstitial, and intraalveolar edema with the position of fluid. The alveolar wall becomes lined with waxy hyaline membranes. As you can see here, and even here on the higher magnification, these hyaline membranes class consist of fibrin-rich edema fluid admixed with cytoplasmic and lipid remnants of necrotic epithelial cells. Symptoms include dyspnea, tachypnea, which can lead to cyanosis, hypoxemia, and respiratory failure. There is noted appearance of diffuse bilateral infiltrates on X-ray. Hypoxemia may be refractory to your oxygen therapy, and this is due to ventilation perfusion mismatch. Respiratory acidosis can also develop. The lungs have areas that are infiltrated, consolidated, or collapsed. Poorly aerated regions continue to be perfused, producing ventilation perfusion mismatch and hypoxemia. Acute interstitial pneumonia is a term that is used to describe widespread acute lung injury of unknown etiology associated with a rapidly progressive clinical course. Patients present with acute respiratory failure often following an illness of less than three weeks duration that resembles an upper respiratory tract infection. The radiographic and pathologic features are identical to those of your organizing stage of acute lung injury. Now, we will be discussing the obstructive and restrictive lung diseases. Obstructive lung diseases are characterized by an increase in resistance to airflow due to partial or complete obstruction at any level from the trachea and larger bronchi to the terminal and respiratory bronchioles. Restrictive diseases are characterized by reduced expansion of lung parenchyma and decreased total lung capacity. The distinction between these chronic non-infectious diffuse pulmonary diseases is based primarily on pulmonary function tests. An FEV1 to FVC ratio of less than 0.7 generally indicates airway obstruction. In contrast, restrictive diseases are associated with proportionate decreases in both total lung capacity and FEV1, leading to normal FEV1 to FVC ratio. This table lists the common obstructive lung diseases. Emphysema and chronic bronchitis are referred to as COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Note that smoking is a common cause of your COPD. While asthma is distinguished from chronic bronchitis and emphysema by the presence of reversible bronchospasm, some patients with otherwise typical asthma also develop an irreversible component. Conversely, some patients with otherwise typical COPD have a reversible component. COPD is a major public health problem. About 35 to 50% of heavy smokers develop COPD. Conversely, 80% of COPD is due to smoking. Emphysema is characterized by the irreversible enlargement of the air spaces distal to the terminal bronchiole accompanied by destruction of their walls without obvious fibrosis. So remember the class is an enlargement of air spaces distal to the terminal bronchiole. Again, it's a terminal bronchiole. Emphysema is classified according to its anatomic distribution within the lobule. Based on the segments of the respiratory units that are involved, emphysema is classified into four major types. It can be centriacinar, papanacinar, paraseptal, and irregular. Centriacinar emphysema is also known as centrilobular emphysema. In this type of emphysema, the central or proximal parts of the sinai formed by the respiratory bronchioles are affected, whereas the distal alveoli are spared. As you can see in the image, there's dilation of the respiratory bronchioles, whereas the alveolar sacs and alveolar ducts are normal in size. The lesions are more common and usually more severe in the upper lobes, 
particularly in the apical segments. Centriacinar emphysema occurs predominantly in heavy smokers, often in association with chronic bronchitis. Crossly, there is marked emphysematous change in the respiratory bronchioles surrounded by normal size alveolar sacs. Next, we have panacinar, also called as your panlobular emphysema. In this type of emphysema, the acini are uniformly enlarged from the level of the respiratory bronchioles to the terminal alveoli. In contrast to centriacinar emphysema, panacinar emphysema tends to occur more commonly in the lower zones and in the anterior margins of the lung and is usually most severe at the bases. This type of emphysema class is associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Grossly, you can see the presence of dilation of the alveolar sacs in all lung tissue. Microscopically, there's emphysematous change from the respiratory bronchioles to your alveolar sac. So this is your bronchioles class, and this will be your alveolar sac. So it's panacinar, which means everything. Next, we have the distal acinar, also called as your paraseptal emphysema. In this type, the proximal portion of the asinus is normal, whereas the distal part is predominantly involved. Emphysema is more striking adjacent to the pleura, along the lobular connective tissue septa and at the margins of the lobules. It occurs adjacent to areas of fibrosis, scarring, or atelectasis, and is usually more severe in the upper half of the lungs. This type of emphysema class probably underlies many causes of spontaneous pneumothorax in young adults. So again, for your distal acinar emphysema, the emphysematous changes are commonly located at the edge of the lung tissue, as you can see here. Arascopically, this corresponds to the septum here, and this is the emphysematous change. We also have your airspace enlargement with fibrosis, also called as your irregular emphysema. In this type, the asinus is irregularly involved, hence its name. It's almost invariably associated with scarring, and in most instances, it's uh, clinically insignificant. So just remember, class, for irregular emphysema, it's clinically insignificant. So what is the pathogenesis of emphysema? Inhaled cigarette smoke and other noxious particles cause lung damage and inflammation, which results in parenchymal destruction and airway disease. Inflammatory mediators and leukocytes are released by resident epithelial cells and macrophage and attract inflammatory cells from the circulation and amplify the inflammatory process and induce structural changes. Proteases are released from the inflammatory cells and epithelial cells that break down connective tissue components. In patients who develop emphysema, there's a relative deficiency of protective antiproteases. Oxidants promote tissue damage and inflammation. Inactivation of NRF2 gene makes cells susceptible to oxidant damage. Infections also may exacerbate the associated inflammation and chronic bronchitis. Patients with a genetic deficiency of the antiprotease alpha-1 antitrypsin have a marked enhanced tendency to develop pulmonary emphysema. It is a major inhibitor of proteases, especially your elastase, which is secreted by neutrophils during inflammation. Alpha-1 antitrypsin class is encoded by the proteinase inhibitor on chromosome 14. Again, class, for those patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin, what type of emphysema? They will develop your panacinar or panlobular emphysema. Symptoms do not appear until at least one-third of the functioning pulmonary parenchyma is damaged. Typically, patients are barrel-chested and breathes through pursed lips. They are called your pink puffers. Death is most commonly due to your CAD, respiratory failure, 
right-sided heart failure, or collapse of the lung parenchyma. So for the other forms of emphysema, we have your compensatory hyperinflation. This is due to the expansion of the residual lung tissue. We also have obstructive overinflation. This is secondary to air trapping, especially in obstructive cases such as a tumor or the presence of a foreign object. We also have your bolus emphysema, which is due to your blebs, and your interstitial emphysema, which is secondary to entrance of air to the connective tissue of the lung or from the subcutaneous tissue. Now, the second type of obstructive lung disease is your chronic bronchitis. So, remember this class. Chronic bronchitis is defined clinically as persistent cough with sputum production for at least three months in at least two consecutive years in the absence of other identifiable cause. This is common in habitual smokers and inhabitants of smog laden cities. Chronic bronchitis is one end of the spectrum of your COPD. The primary or initiating factor in the pathogenesis of chronic bronchitis is exposure to noxious or irritating inhaled substances such as tobacco smoke or dust from grain, cotton, or silica. The earliest feature of chronic bronchitis is hypersecretion of mucus in the large airways associated with hypertrophy of the submucosa glands in the trachea and bronchi. There's also a marked increase in goblet cells of the small airways, which leads to excessive mucus production that contributes to airway obstruction. Inhalants that induce chronic bronchitis cause cellular damage, eliciting both acute and chronic inflammatory responses involving neutrophils, lymphocytes, and macrophages. Infection does not initiate bron chronic bronchitis but is probably significant in maintaining it and may be critical in producing acute exacerbations. So grossly, there is hyperemia, swelling and edema of the mucous membranes, and sometimes this can be accompanied by presence of mucinous or purulent secretions within the air spaces. The major change class of your chronic bronchitis is the presence of mucous gland hyperplasia, as you can see here. This increase can be assessed by the ratio of the thickness of the mucous gland layer to the thickness of the wall between the epithelium and the cartilage. You call that your RAID index. The normal RAID index class is 0 0.4, and this is increased in chronic bronchitis, usually in proportion to the severity and duration of the disease. The cardinal symptom of chronic bronchitis is persistent cough with sputum production. With the passage of time, and usually with uh, continued smoking, other elements of COPD may appear, including hypercapnia, hypoxemia, and mild cyanosis. Chronic bronchitis patients are called your blue bloaters. Asthma is a chronic disorder of the conducting airways, usually caused by an immunological reaction which is marked by episodic bronchoconstriction due to increased airway sensitivity to a variety of stimuli, inflammation of the bronchial walls, and increased mucus secretion. The disease is manifested by recurrent episodes of wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness, and cough, particularly at night or in the early morning. Atopic asthma is the most common type of asthma and is a classic example of your IgE-mediated or type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. This is common in childhood and is triggered by environmental allergens such as dust or animal dander. And sometimes, this uh, frequently acts in synergy with, with your viral infections. A positive family history of asthma is common and a skin test with offending agent results in an immediate wheel and flare reaction. Individuals with non-atopic asthma do not have evidence of allergen sensitization and skin test results are usually negative. A positive family history of asthma is less common in these patients. Respiratory viral infections are common triggers as well as inhaled air pollutants. 
In some instances, attacks may be triggered by seemingly innocuous events, such as exposure to cold and even exercise. We also have drug-induced asthma. Several pharmacologic agents can trigger asthma. An example would be your aspirin-sensitive asthma. This is common in individuals with recurrent rhinitis and nasal polyps. Aspirin and other NSAIDs triggers asthma in these patients by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase pathway of arachidonic acid metabolism, leading to a rapid decrease in prostaglandin E2. Normally, prostaglandin E2 inhibits enzymes that generate pro-inflammatory mediators such as leukotienes B4, C4, D4, and E4, which are believed to have central roles in aspirin-induced asthma. We also have your occupational asthma. This form of asthma may be triggered by fumes such as from your epoxy resins or plastics, organic and chemical dust, gases, or other chemicals such as formaldehyde. Here you can see a comparison of, a, of an airway of a patient with asthma and that of a normal airway. So as you can see here, the asthmatic airway is marked by accumulation of mucus in the bronchial lumen, which is due to an increase in the number of mucus secreting goblet cells in the mucosa here, and the presence of hypertrophy of submucosal glands, as you can see here. There's also noted basement membrane thickening, which is due to inflammation. Note also the numerous inflammatory cells consisting of eosinophils, macrophages, and other inflammatory cells. There's also hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the smooth muscle cells. A fundamental abnormality in asthma class is an exaggerated taste to response to normally harmless environmental antigens. If you can remember, taste 2 cells secrete cytokines that promote inflammation and stimulate B cells to produce IgE and other antibodies. Interleukin-4 stimulates IgE production. Interleukin-5, as you can see here, activates locally recruited eosinophils. And interleukin-13 stimulates mucus production for the bronchial submucosa glands and also promotes IgE production by the B cells. IgE binds to the FC receptor of your submucosal mast cells and repeat exposure of the allergen triggers mast cells to release granule contents and produce cytokines and other mediators, which induces the early phase reaction and the late phase reaction of the disease. The early reaction is dominated by bronchoconstriction, increased mucus production, variable degrees of vasodilation, and increased vascular permeability. Bronchoconstriction is triggered by direct stimulation of subepithelial vagal receptors through both central and local reflexes, triggered by mediators produced by mast cells and other cells in the reaction. The late phase reaction occurs hours after, is dominated by the recruitment of leukocytes, notably eosinophils, neutrophils, and more T cells. This is the reason class why in asthma, we give two types of medications the relievers and controllers. The relievers, such as your salbutamol and ipratropium, will act on the immediate phase. They will, they will prevent the bronchoconstriction. It, they will relax the smooth muscle, thus preventing bronchoconstriction. The glucocorticoids, given for asthma, acts on the late phase, so it will act on the inflammatory cells, so it will prevent the late phase reaction. Many mediators produced by leukocytes and epithelial cells have been implicated in the asthmatic response. Examples would be your leukotiene C4, D4, and E4, which cause prolonged bronchoconstriction and increase vascular permeability and increase mucosecretion. Acetylcholine, released from the intrapulmonary parasympathetic nerves, cause airway smooth muscle constriction by directly simulating muscarinic receptors, histamine, prostaglandin D2, 
and platelet activating factor can also cause bronchoconstriction. Susceptibility to atopic asthma is multigenic and often associated with increased incidence of other allergic disorders such as allergic rhinitis, hay fever, and eczema. One susceptibility locus for asthma is located on chromosome 5q near the gene cluster encoding the cytokines interleukin 3, 4, 5, 9, 13, and the interleukin 4 receptor. Among the genes in this cluster class, polymorphisms in the interleukin 13 gene have the strongest and most consistent association with asthma or allergic disease. Environmental factors also contribute to the pathogenesis of asthma. Industrialized environments contain many airborne pollutants that can serve as allergens to initiate the TH2 response. Infections themselves are not a cause or trigger of asthma, but young children with uh, aero allergen sensitization who develop lower respiratory tract viral infections have a 10 to 30 fold increased risk of developing persistent or severe asthma. In patients who died due to severe asthma, the lungs are distended and overinflated and contain small areas of atelectasis. Other gross findings include occlusion of the bronchi and bronchioles by thick mucus plugs, which often contain shedded epithelium. So this is your bronchial cast formed by a mucus plug. A characteristic finding in sputum or bronchoalveolar lavage specimens is a Kirschman spirals, which may result from extrusion of mucus plugs from the subepithelial mucus gland ducts or bronchioles. Also present are numerous eosinophils and charcot laden crystals, as you can see here. The crystals class are composed of your eosinophilic protein called your galactin 10. Over time, repeated bouts of allergen exposure and immune reactions result in structural changes in the bronchial wall referred to as airway remodeling. So there will be thickening of the airway wall, there will be fibrosis of the basement membrane, there will be increase in the size of the submucosal glands and increased number of mucosal goblet cells. Also, there will be hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the bronchial smooth muscle. Now, let's discuss bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis is a disorder in which destruction of smooth muscle and elastic tissue by chronic necrotizing infections lead to a permanent dilation of bronchi and your bronchioles. Obstruction and infection are the major conditions associated with bronchiectasis, and it is likely that both are necessary for the development of full-fledged lesions. After bronchial obstruction class, the normal clearing mechanisms are impaired, which results in pooling of secretions distal to the obstruction and secondary infection and inflammation. Other diseases associated with bronchiectasis are the following. In cystic fibrosis, the primary defect in ion transport leads to defective mucociliary action and airway obstruction by thick viscous secretions. This sets the stage for chronic bacterial infections, which cause widespread damage to airway walls. In primary ciliary dyskinesia, which is an autosomal recessive syndrome, ciliary dysfunction due to defects in ciliary motor proteins contributes to the retention of secretions and recurrent infections that in turn lead to bronchiectasis. In allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, the intense airway inflammation with eosinophils and the formation of mucus plugs will play a role in the pathogenesis of, of bronchiectasis. As you can see here, class, grossly, the airways are dilated Sometimes, there will be presence of mucus plugs. Bronchiectasis causes severe persistent cough, expectoration of foul smelling, sometimes bloody sputum, dyspnea and orthopnea in severe cases, and on occasion, hemoptysis, which may be massive. 
So on microscopic examination, you can see here the presence of dilated airways and the presence of mucus plug. There's also loss of the mucosa and submucosa on some of the airways. Higher magnification will be presence of numerous inflammatory infiltrates. So that ends my lecture for today class. I will see you again on the next meeting.